Hey everyone, I'm Mackenzie Dyer with Bradford's Alumni Program. I'm here today with Tim Hilton. He's actually a Bradford alumni himself, as well as a national recovery advocate. He's going to be with us the next several weeks as he discusses some recovery stories along his own journey. I hope you all enjoy. Hey guys, my name is Tim Hilton, and uh, I've been working with Bradford Healthcare Services for about 12 and a half years now. Um, these days, I'm a consultant to Bradford, and I'm, I'm just really thrilled uh, to, to be here today with you guys and to have the opportunity to come on and, and hopefully share some of my experience, strength, and hope. Uh, I hope it's good. I hope it's useful. Thanks. On um, February 23rd of 2005, I came out of a 30-day blackout, laying on a filthy couch wearing nothing but a pair of filthy underwear. I weighed 148 pounds. It's like a walking skeleton. My eyes were blacked out, my cheeks were caved in, and I wanted to die. You know, in truth, it wasn't really that I wanted to die, it was that I couldn't figure out how to keep living. I couldn't figure out how to stop the insanity that had become my life. I, I had lost all relationship I had with myself, with, with others, and certainly with God. And, and I just didn't know how to keep going. I, um, I took a stolen pistol. And I caught the hammer stuck the barrel in my mouth, and I prayed to a God I didn't believe in anymore for the strength to pull the trigger. You know, I've, I've heard stories of, of, of alcoholics and, and becoming suicidal in the end, and I've, and I've heard a number of them talk about miraculous happenings. You know, how they held the gun to their head and they cocked the, the hammer and they pulled the trigger and and, 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 the, and the bullet didn't fire, and, and these amazing interventions that, that saved their life. But it's not my story. My story is I wanted to pull the trigger, and I, and I didn't have the strength, and I didn't have the courage. And I prayed, and I said, God, you know, if you're there, just please, please help me end this. I can't do it anymore. Instead of, uh, instead of the strength to, to end my life, uh, instead, God filled my head with images of, of my beautiful little boy, four-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed. And all I could think about was what it was gonna be like for him to grow up with people talking about how his junkie dad blew himself away. And, and, and I was afraid he would blame himself somehow. And, and you know, I didn't love me anymore. But somewhere inside, I still loved my son. And, and I couldn't leave him with that legacy. And so I set the pistol down and I picked up the phone and I called a guy. I called a guy that I had met in, in a 12-step meeting. Um, I had wandered in and out of 12-step meetings for a couple of years at this point. Uh, I, I knew I wanted the pain to stop, but I was never willing to do the things that they suggested to me I do in there. I always had this idea that the steps were some kind of a con game and that if I could just figure out what, what the trick was underneath it, I could avoid I could avoid doing all that silly stuff they're doing. I don't need to go to a meeting every day. I don't, I don't need to work these steps. I just need to figure out the trick that these guys have learned and, and I'll do that. Um, but I, I, never, I never figured out the trick. And finally broken, I, I call this, this guy I had met in a 12-step meeting. Uh, he had told me that if I, if I ever needed him, I could call him. Uh, and I called him up. His name was Jesse. And I said, hey, Jesse, man, listen, I, th I think I need to go to treatment. And he said, okay, when, when do you want to go? I said, yeah, uh, how, how about tomorrow? Because, uh, see, that's how we are, right? As, as addicts. We won't, we won't help tomorrow. We're dying today, but we won't help tomorrow. Not, not right now. 
Jesse knew this, and, and he said, no, no, Tim, how, how about right now? And he hung the phone up on me. About, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes later, he showed up, and he walked in, and, and he, threw a, he threw a Walmart sack at me. And he said, put some clothes in there. It's time to leave. And to this day, I don't really know why I listened to him, why I did what he told me to, but I got up, and, and I stuffed a bunch of dirty clothes into a bag, and I followed him out the door. We, um, we got in his car, and uh, we got in the car, and his wife and his little girl were in the car too. And, uh, and, and, I, and I realized all of a sudden they were all dressed really nice. You know, they were like Sunday best clothes. And, and, and I remember saying, hey man, why'd you guys dress up to take me to rehab? Well, of course they had. It turns out that they were on their way to their anniversary dinner. And instead, he came and he got me. He stopped at a convenience store and he bought his, he bought his family peanut butter crackers. And that's what they ate for their anniversary dinner that night. He drove me 45 minutes to Bradford Healthcare Services. And he sat in a parking lot for two hours while Bradford frantically tried to get approval from my insurance company. And I kept saying, hey man, it's okay, it's okay, you can go. He said, man, I'm not going anywhere. Not until I know you're okay. It's emotional, you know, it's emotional to recall this because what that man did was he loved me when I couldn't love myself. He barely knew me. But he loved me because he understood He'd been there. He knew what it was like. And he understood.